the compact disc interactive a necessity for gracious living Oh yes, the Philips CDI, one of the most maligned pieces of hardware in all of gaming's history. Released in 1990, this Dutch-developed console was an early optical disc machine and remains heavily mocked for the many missteps taken throughout this platform's life. Suffering from an identity crisis, the CDI never seemed quite sure what it wanted to be. This means that confusion persists around the system right up until this very day. Utilising a form of media storage spearheaded by eventual rival Sony, Philips used the CDI format in various ways. However, over its eight years on the market, it never found the foothold it wanted, leaving both themselves and consumers disappointed. The CDI was a platform that could be used to watch movies, access educational programs and even play games featuring Nintendo's most famous characters. So let's look at what went horribly wrong for Philips that sealed this system's fate as a failure. Join me today as we take a trip back in time to discuss one of the most infamous consoles that has ever been released. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the Philips CDI and why it failed. The road to the Philips CDI begins as far back as 1982. This was a year in which Philips and Sony worked together and released the first compact disc in Japan, with 1983 seeing the format hit North America and Europe too. While it took some time to reach market saturation, the CD-ROM could feature more than an hour of stereo audio, making it perfect for music playback. As general consumer computers were still in their infancy, it would be improbable that computer users would need to consume or create over 650 megabytes of code or text, and music didn't require any graphical or displaying processing power, so CDs were primarily used for music for now. Eventually, the CD format would expand with video and photo CDs, leading to the DVD and Blu-ray, but before we got to those, we had CDIs. The CDI format would be developed by Sony and Philips, featuring the capability to hold up to 72 minutes of full motion video. Conceptually, this wouldn't be ideal for a major Hollywood film, as early DVDs showed nobody wants to flip their copies of Goodfellas or Air Force One in the middle of the movie. But 72 minutes would be more than enough for the burgeoning edutainment and video gaming market, adding cutscenes to games like Myst and the production of full adventures like Space Ace and the legendary Dragon's Lair. Our interactive dreams seemed to be coming true. The Philips CDI console was launched in 1991 as a multimedia platform developed by Philips Electronics to bridge the gap between video game consoles and home computers. The CDI utilised CD-ROMs to provide interactive entertainment, educational and reference applications, aiming to be an all-in-one machine that serves multiple needs. The CDI console was marketed as a complete multimedia system, capable of playing audio CDs, video CDs and CDI titles. It featured various accessories, including a wireless controller, a pointing device called the Roller Controller, and a keyboard for text input. Philips would release the first version of their player for North America in December 1991, followed by Japan and Europe in the following years. Spread over several variants from 1992 to 1998, like a VCR player, CDIs were manufactured with different designs, plugins, and ports. Philips would not be the only one releasing CDI hardware either, as companies such as Magnavox, Memorex, Bang & Olufsen, and notably Sony and Goldstar, would all jump in on the action too. Everyone wanted a piece of CDI action. Now, what may come as a shock to you is that although the CDI is primarily remembered as a bad game console today, believe it or not, back in 1991, Philips did little in the way of marketing their hardware around gaming. The Philips CDI would hit shelves often described as a family entertainment product, with video games deliberately being avoided because Philips didn't feel it was wise to try and compete directly with Nintendo or Sega. This meant that marketing would be heavily focused on educational, music and self-improvement titles, with the only games being promoted being adaptations of simple family board games such as Connect 4. 
But the big issue was that by not competing with game consoles, Philips competed with PCs instead. Consumers were not stupid. Many realised they could get all the benefits of the CDI and more simply by buying a low-end PC instead. This meant that Philips would need to try and change their way of thinking to make their hardware more attractive to customers. Over two years, I can imagine conversations at Philips would take place that looked a lot like this. Turn! Okay. Turn! Pivot! 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 Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! That's right, they were trying pivot. At the 1992 Consumer Electronics Show, many full motion video games such as the already legendary Dragon's Lair and Mad Dog McCree would be revealed for the hardware, but perhaps most exciting of all, the announcement of a game called Burn Cycle, an interactive cyberpunk adventure that promised to combine full motion video with exploration, puzzle solving and action. The Super Nintendo certainly wouldn't be bringing any games like this. A range of interactive video games based on popular TV shows would soon be announced. These would include Jeopardy, Name That Tune and Joker's Wild, to name a few. The following year, 1993, would also continue to see Philips double down on the gaming side of things, encouraging the likes of MS-DOS and console developers to begin creating more games for the hardware. But that's not all. The same year would see the release of a $250 peripheral with more memory that would allow users to watch video CDs on the platform, the DVD before the DVD. So in theory, the CDI interactive media player was starting to slightly look like it had things going for it. But uh, the CDI would offer one more crazy feature that keeps it in the spotlight even today. I am, of course, talking about the Mario and Zelda CDI games. A ridiculous thing to exist, considering that Nintendo is usually so protectionist regarding letting their IPs appear on other people's hardware. So what would transpire in this case that led to an exception to such a rule? As history shows us, Sony would eventually, after a failed attempt at developing a CD-ROM add-on for the Super Nintendo, turn their hard work on the Nintendo PlayStation into the beginning of their own legacy, the Sony PlayStation. While this isn't the time to discuss this abandoned project in detail, Nintendo initially signed a contract with Sony to develop a CD accessory for the Super Famicom, using a new Super Disk format as Sony has provided the sound chip in the 16-bit console. Hiroshi Yamauchi, Nintendo president at the time, would be concerned about the deal as it would require developers to commit to development tools from Sony. And soon Nintendo of America president Minoru Arakawa and executive Howard Lincoln would travel to the Netherlands to work out a plan with Philips, without Sony's knowledge. This led to Sony announcing the Nintendo PlayStation at 1991's Consumer Electronics Show. The following day, Nintendo would reveal their partnership with Philips, abandoning the deal with Sony and creating one of their greatest enemies. While a Philips-developed Super Nintendo add-on would never materialise either, this agreement would contractually allow Philips to use Nintendo characters for their own games on their own hardware, a deal that it appears that Nintendo was happy to agree to since the Philips CDI was initially marketed as an interactive media device rather than a game console. Philips were basically the new ugly lover that Nintendo had dumped the sexy handsome Sony for. Now, I don't need to tell you much about Hotel Mario and the Zelda games available for the platform. YouTube, poop and meme culture have helped immortalise these curiosities forever. However, I will say that none of these would pan out to be classic games that would help shift CDI platform sales. Rather amusingly, beyond this, there were plans for even more Mario games. One title that was abandoned with the failure of the console would be Super Mario's Wacky Worlds, a Nova Logic developed sequel to the Super Nintendo Classic. And Mario Goes to America, which would see Mario exploring the real world, complete with live action footage to be integrated into the graphics. Unfortunately, neither was to be. But we can play the unfinished Wacky Worlds by downloading what exists online.
As the 1990s continued, the CDI would find itself in a weird place, as it wasn't a console, a computer or a media device. It's like when Steve Jobs promoted the first iPhone as a cell phone, an iPod and a mobile internet device. So you just assumed it would be rubbish at all of those things, so you would just pass on it. Despite not being initially marketed as a game console, the CDI would surprisingly have over 200 games released in its lifetime. Time, a decent number considering the marketing pivot that took place. Games that regular gamers at the time would recognise on the console would be Tetris, The Seventh Guest, Namco's collection of arcade classics, Brain Dead 13, Dragon's Lair, Flashback, Lemmings, Mad Dog McCree, Micro Machines, Mist, Pack Panic, Rise of the Robots, and Space Ace, to name a few. Many of these games could be considered perfect for the console, minimal controls in the case of the arcade classics, Tetris and Pack Panic, or taking full advantage of the multimedia power of the system with the quick time event adventures. However, many of these titles were spammed on every console at the time that could handle them, hence it says less about the CDI being an attractive game destination and more about these developers who would try and shove mist on everything under the sun. But uh, there were some more exciting releases. Most notably, the Hulk Hogan classic television series Thunder in Paradise received a game for both the CDI and MS-DOS, developed by Philips POV Entertainment. Step aside, Sonic the Hedgehog. What are you gonna do when Hulkamania comes to your video game console, brother? Jokes aside, games like this are about as good as it gets for the hardware as the title combines full motion video, action adventure and interactive elements that use the CDI's capabilities. Other cult favourites on the platform include the likes of Mutant Rampage Body Slam, a very basic beat-em-up but by far the best or perhaps the only one on the platform. The game is not best remembered for its action but instead for the hilarious animated cutscenes. The Komodos wear sissy pants, Elwolf! For us, it is a matter of honour and enjoyment. The Carnivoros are dumb as toads, Elwolf! Wait till the Naturals fight somebody smart! Their greatness is because this game is by Animation Magic, the same developer behind Hotel Mario and the first two CDI Zelda games. Of course, we also can't talk about the Philips CDI without talking more about Burn Cycle, which came in this spiffing neon green casing. In this fifth element looking madness, players assume the role of Soul Cutter, a computer hacker infected with a computer virus known as the Burn Cycle. The game takes place in a dystopian future where players must navigate Soul through a series of puzzles and challenges to prevent the virus from reaching his brain and killing him within two hours. Players interact with various characters and objects in a futuristic city environment, searching for clues and items to progress through the story. The game features full motion video sequences and a unique visual style characteristic of CDI games. While the CDI platform did not achieve great commercial success, Burn Cycle remains one of the more notable titles for the system. Its blend of cyberpunk aesthetics, interactive storytelling and challenging gameplay made it a cult classic among CDI enthusiasts. As a result, it is the best selling game in the platform's history too. As for playing these damn games, various controllers would provide an inconsistent approach to playing the titles developed for the platform. More traditional ones would feature three or four buttons and a D-pad, possibly with a joystick add-on. Continuing that it was as much of a multimedia player as a relatively fouled game console, various mice and remotes were developed which attempted to provide game controls while being approachable to non-gamers. The console even featured a gun accessory for a handful of titles that would take advantage of it. Still, since it ran on the same technology as the mouse, it could theoretically be used across multiple software titles. Zelda with a gun is more likely than you think. So, with a few things going for it, how come things would end up going so wrong for Philips with this one? The problems with the CDI largely stem for its nature as a jack of all trades, master of none. 
While many machines could successfully combine multiple purposes, such as the Sony PlayStation 2 gaining market dominance simply for being a tolerable but affordable DVD player. Other pieces of technology haven't proven quite as popular in gaming. For example, nobody remembers the iPod for its few video games, even if it had some Square Enix exclusives. The spread of possible content meant that the device had to come at an appropriate price. The Super Nintendo would retail for a relatively high $199 versus the established Sega Genesis, coming down in price due to its lead on the market. While the device had a then-revolutionary CD-ROM drive, consumers would hesitate to drop $799 at launch. Sony could effectively make an infinitely better device launching at half the price as former bosom buddies Philips device, which would put things into perspective for consumers. It's not always about being first to market, but finding the balance between quality and affordability. Years into a surprisingly subdued but long run, Philips would offer a CD online add-on with a modem, but online gameplay would not meet the breakthrough they might have hoped for. After the console's demise, homebrew developers would create a handful of indie titles. Still, even that wouldn't get off the ground in any significance, as it was more of a novelty than anything else. Fans of the console are small but dedicated, as websites such as The World of CDI aim to be comprehensive in documenting everything released for the console, including the surprising amount of variants of the console itself. As a relative blip in the gaming consciousness, most players nowadays remember the console for its odd assortment of officially licensed Nintendo titles, its connection to the creation and inevitable rise of the Sony PlayStation and its aftermarket scarcity. The Zelda games regularly go from $200 to $1,200 on eBay, and Hotel Mario is only slightly cheaper. Consoles or interactive players can be found in the hundreds, but due to their scarcity and general malaise, they don't appear to be swarming the online shop. The CDI is primarily considered a commercial failure today, with the platform's lack of focus playing a considerable role in its downfall. While designed to combine video, audio and interactive features, Philips struggled to define a clear target audience or purpose for the CDI, resulting in a lack of focus marketing and positioning. This made it difficult for consumers to understand the value and appeal of the system. Although the CDI had some notable titles, the game library was relatively limited compared to other gaming consoles. The lack of compelling and exclusive games undermined its potential as a gaming platform. After the pivot towards gaming, the CDI faced tough competition from established gaming consoles like the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis and later the Sony PlayStation. These consoles had more substantial game libraries, larger user bases and better developer support, making it challenging for the CDI to gain traction in the gaming market. Finally, the CDI had certain technical limitations that affected its performance. It had slow loading times, limited graphical capabilities and some cumbersome controller designs. These factors contributed to a subpar gaming experience and further deterred potential buyers. These factors combined are why the Philips CDI failed. Despite its innovative features and potential, it could not find a strong market position and could not compete effectively with other gaming consoles and multimedia platforms. But at least we will always have the memes.